Welcome to another Rugby League Down South podcast. Coming up, a feature interview with London Broncos head coach Joey Grimer. New signings, his recruitment criteria and the culture he's trying to build at the London club. We'll hear from a teacher at a school that has been the first to defend a champion school's title in the South. Well done to the Year 10 girls at Lee Academy. And we'll speak to the head coach at Valley Cougars, Paul Emanuele. He's the assistant at the South Wales Scorpions. We'll hear about the Cougars. Impressive season and no doubt we'll touch on the Scorpions too. Uh, thanks again for your support. Listens are not doing too bad on the podcast. So uh, your thoughts and interaction on what Joey Grimer is about to say would be very much appreciated. On Twitter at Ian Ramsdale, you can use the hashtag RLDS or you can email rldownsouth at gmail.com. Some interesting stuff on the way then from Joey Grimer, the Broncos head coach. He's been building a very impressive squad for 2015. Wesley Garmer, the latest to be added, the Fiji International Centre. And they've got a win under their belt, of course, in their last game against Leeds before the uh, Challenge Cup final, which Leeds Rhinos won. So, yeah, beating the uh, Challenge Cup winners for this year, I'm sure. Well, people will uh, argue the... uh, pros and cons of how the win happened but you know it's a fact isn't it um speaking to andrea henderson uh, as well last week i was uh, more on that in a moment but i did want to sit down for a chat a nice long chat uh, with joey grimer thankfully he agreed so enjoy this it is a long and comprehensive full of facts and information and an insight into how joey works at the club but uh, all things covered in this interview myself with joey grimer joey you've had a couple of days now to um reflect on that result from the weekend um, overall how do you look back on it now I think given where we were uh, 29 minutes to go um, is what a lot of people have ex- expected uh, I think there was even with the side that um, Brian Mack had, had put out there uh, I think they had a 32 start on us so the scoreline reflected on mostly of what everyone was thinking anyway um, but given the last 29 minutes half an hour um, I, I made it open. Uh, I made it uh, openly um, apparent that it was certainly the greatest win of my coaching career. And um, given to come back um, against a side, against a, a quality team and a quality club like Leeds, uh, 30 points to eight to win that game is, um, yeah, very surreal still four or five days after the event. Do you think that in any way people have not played it down but they say you know Leeds weren't at full strength does that make any difference to you does it does it take a, a, a slight tinge off the win or or is it it's two points it's a win yeah it definitely is two points given that again uh, they're in front 30 to 8 uh, would suggest that no matter who was out there what team was out there it showed their capabilities of um, them being a good team um, and People, I understand people have said that you know six or seven players uh, weren't there that would have been there, but um, it is what it is. It's two points in our books, and the fact that we got the two points, um, it's, it was a, it was a great day for our club uh, and getting the monkey off our back. The victory is there. What was the reason that it happened from a footballing point of view that they worked on Sunday and it hasn't worked in the previous part of the year? That's a real difficult question to answer, Ramo, and uh, me as a head coach, I should know these answers. However, um, sometimes things just happen and gel, and it's a part of momentum, it's a part of um, staying in the game, and when you've got the ball, um, you know, that last 29 minutes, we had the ball uh, for 76% of the time, and when you're completing your sets, and when you've got all the momentum, things just happen. In this game, you have to be prepared to make your own luck and maintain the momentum when you have it. Now, given that um, Zach Hardacre, arguably the best fullback in the competition, went from fullback to their left centre, was a, um, uh, a real tactical um, response from where we are. Being a, a fullback defending um, behind the line is completely different to defending in the line two or three on an edge. So we certainly channeled our attention um, to that area and there were some uh, players that probably didn't have the experience of the uh, the boroughs who would have been in that position so with that uh, we certainly took um, took advantage of of the positional change 
And what generally has been the key to that, to, to getting that victory? Because I put it down to a lot of hard work over the year, you know, looking at what's been going on behind the scenes with you, your coaching staff, with the players, with the office staff. It seemed like the club was going in the right direction. That's why I always thought in the back of my mind that there probably was a win somewhere around the corner. I mean, what would you put the, the general um, feeling of, of getting that win as, as, a, as a response of? So a response of a lot of things, I need to um, give my staff uh, a huge rap and, and the administrative staff here, both back back uh, um, backroom staff and administrative staff, because things happen for a reason. Um, I ask my staff to be challenged, uh, cha- challenged players. I ask my pl- uh, staff, backroom staff, to be professional, uh, courteous on time, and you know make training enjoyable. And I think um, for for whatever reason. Things just gelled and, and came to fruition. So I really need to give a huge rap to my backroom staff for the efforts and what they're doing. And given that um, I, as the head coach, had to make a, a number of drastic changes in identifying, you know, the coaching philosophies we currently have, and and just a, a lot of other things which make or go into running a club. The fact that um, we've got uh, five players moving on to Super League clubs and 17 players told that they're not wanted here or not required for next year, you know, it certainly does make it very, very difficult to maintain that motivation aspect. Um, But thankfully, on the weekend, um, things just happened the way they did and we were able to follow the instructions and um, uh, maintain that momentum. As a head coach, I'm sure you'll say that you didn't think about the win or the victory until the Hooter went and until it was there, but... How did you feel towards the end of that game? And, and when did you think, you know, today could be the day? Because, again, there was a, a try disallowed right on the hooter, or after the hooter, um, which would have spoiled everyone's afternoon. Um, but when was it that in the game that you thought, you know what, I think it could be today? Yeah, I didn't think of any part of the day. Uh, it, during the game, Remo, um, I said to my manager, Chris Thomas, and I said... If anyone can lose this game from here, it'll be the Broncos. And ironically, um, they shifted the ball, Leeds shifted the ball from inside their half, and uh, Watkins, who's arguably the best centre in the competition, um, raced away. And probably the most amazing thing that I've seen as a head coach, Nezi Matiatonga, coming from the left, uh, coming from the right centre, chasing the play and pushing pushing Watkins over the touchline um, by a half foot and but at no stage Ramo I had uh, I was confident that you know we had the game bagged because just the quality of their back five um, absolutely superb and it seemed like watching the video I thought when I was there at, live on the game the touch judge took an eternity to put the to put his flag up but having review and reviewed that straight after the game he put his flag up straight away but it seemed like an eternity and um yeah we're certainly relieved i've seen that flag go up how did you feel at the time because i mean the, the clock's ticking down the hooter goes you know and you think okay this is it this is it um it must have been was it was it relief when you got the win was it was it just reward did you think we we've, we've got there i mean how did you feel when when you you knew that was it two points it was pretty emotional um i having not won for four months um a lot of our our supporters our london bronco supporters hasn't have not been a, a part of a home based victory since april last year and you always say to yourself that, oh, I can't wait till the first win. But uh, in that reaction, I've had a lot of success with other teams, but with this one in particular, um, I was very emotional. It was very emotional. It was a monkey off our back. It was a huge weight off the shoulders. And I guess it was just a just reward for the players. That's, that's who it meant a lot to. And I was really proud that we were able to play the 30 minutes of a lifetime. Um, for the players that played on that day and certainly the backroom staff because um, we've had a tough, tough year this year um, given we haven't had an off-season and a change in coach and a number of decisions had to be made by myself and, and as senior management but it was a pretty emotional, emotional day and the, probably the fact that Adriana, my wife, and my two kids, Frank and Josephine, weren't able to witness it as they're overseas on holiday. So... Um, yeah, it was certainly an emotional day for, for, for me, but, you know, just great for our club. Is it wrong to celebrate the fact that you now won't go a full season 
and have lost every game and the fact that okay you have games in hand at the moment but you've only won one um i'm delighted we won a game um I understand we have uh, the record for most consecutive losses in Super League and you know it's a title or it's a, uh, something that no coach wants but having won a game on the weekend it uh, stops another um, another record that no one's not won a game during a Super League season but Remo I know where, where I am as a coach, um, the club knows where uh, they are as a club uh, we're making some inroads with our recruitment we're um, structuring or restructuring our whole organisation, uh, organisational structure. We're creating a pathway for uh, local-based players to go through into the first team, and we're creating a rapport with the community clubs. And success isn't always measured by the amount of China in the cabinet. And we're going to being relegated down to Championship, and I think for where we are, the London Broncos, it probably came at a good time. Ideally, no one likes to be relegated. However, given if we were in Super League next year, um, we would be uh, in a similar situation, scrapping where we need to strip back the paint and prepare and create our own success and our own procedures. You mentioned the numbers before about the players that are moving on, or players that are no longer going to be part of this setup for next year. Would you have liked to have kept more? I mean, I mentioned names like Kieran Dixon, I guess. You know, you put an offer in, you did want to keep him, as I'm sure many a club would. How many did you hope that you wanted to keep and you couldn't? The uh, Certainly the five five players that have elected to play Super League, the um, Matt Cooks, the Daniel Solomonas, the um, uh, Atelier Vays, the Scott Moores, and certainly more of recent Kieran Dixon's offers were made to all of those. Uh, but in particular, Kieran, we made a substantial offer to him and we were negotiating with um, Kieran's management company, or his manager for you know eight nine weeks, so um, those players were sought after by our club, and we made fair and reasonable um, um, incentives and, and contracts. But at the end of the day, um, they opted to play Super League and wanted to play Super League, and I would never ever stop anyone uh, from um, bettering their future and playing in the best best competition in in in, in Europe. Comparing those players then with the people that you're recruiting and the side that you're trying to build for next year, have you got players of the same quality, similar quality, you know, slightly lower quality possibly, but you're going into the championship. How would you compare them? It's very difficult to say uh, to compare abilities, but what I am bringing to the club is a level of maturity and a level of success. Um, someone like the uh, Richie Mathers, uh, 280 plus Super League games, played for his country, won uh, uh, titles, um, and played in the NRL. Uh, you've got a bloke. Um, like um, uh, Liam Forum, who's been in the full-time program back uh, back in Australia in the NRL. He's come through the Melbourne Storm and Manly Warringah program. He's uh, a steely person, he's a competitive person and hates losing. It comes from that culture of success with Melbourne, that comes along with playing for Melbourne and for Manly. Then you've got a, a guy like uh, Josh Cordoba, 107 uh, NRL games. He's um, you know 28 years of age, he's a father of two kids, he's a wife, so he's got a lot of responsibilities outside of rugby league. They're the type of characters um, that uh, are coming to our club. And more recently, Wes Nagama has signed a two-year deal. Now, Wes Nagama's played 15 tests for Fiji. He's a 116-game NRL player. And given that those players have opted to come over to play for the London Broncos, suggests that we are doing things the right way. And that's only four or five. We've signed uh, four players from the championship, which inf that information will be released by the 1st of September. Um, so we've got some uh, incredible players, ones that we've retained, uh, the younger players, and certainly some players that have, are coming uh, from abroad. Um, as far as uh, their ability level, um, it's very hard to, to um, um, compare. However, we had a criteria. What we want to build is a culture. Um, you know, Daryl Powell, everyone would admit that on paper, arguably doesn't have the best team, but... He's got that belief and he's got that culture that uh, um, breeds success. Now, if he could write a book about what he's done this year, he'd be a very rich man. And I've got uh, a lot of admiration for what he's done because um, we could be a Cass in, in 12 months, two years, who knows. So um, evidence is there that it does work. It's just about getting the right people at our, at our club. Is that something that you noticed that 
London and Broncos were missing a, a certain culture of the club and, and the way that they should act? Because I know we spoke a couple of months ago and you mentioned the seven-point plan, the six-point plan that you'd put to the chairman uh, and the um, general manager here to say, you know, this is what I think we should do and to embark on something uh, as, a, as a written down... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, as, a, as a written down strategy. Yep. Uh, is that, again, the culture and the strategy is something you thought was missing here? Yeah, I... It, and it's very difficult. Um, Tony Ray's probably saved the club, and Tony Ray had an incredible job last year. In um, you know December, the London Broncos were gone, and then um, at late notice, um, the club was established uh, or re-entered into the competition. And Tony Ray had a tough job to assemble a, a group of players. Now those group of players are players that. Um, wouldn't necessarily be at the top of a lot of other uh, clubs. So Tony um, done the best he could with what was available. And I mean that respectfully to the players because some of those players that he's recruited are moving on a Super League program. So there's no uh, no way of being uh, disrespectful to them. Um, however, what I'm trying to portray is the, what Tony Ray had done for this club arguably had to put a, uh, a side together and I came over in February, so I was a bit of that. And having Josh Drinkwater, Nick Sliney, um, Ben Farah, Atelier Vey turn up round three, round four, round five, that's a huge disruption and on the back of not having an off-season. So to be fair and reasonable to uh, Tony and the previous management, they did their absolute best to what was available at that time. Again, I say that respectfully. So um, um, it certainly um, caused some differences in opinions in in my thoughts having come from the from the NRL into the Super League and I'm I'm very blessed that um the people from um, Super League and have embraced me so well and and now this is my adopted uh, adopted country now um I've got another 2 years here and I'm really glad that um, um I've been allowed to fit in or trans in be transitioned into such a wonderful environment in the UK in the Super League so it was a question of um, identifying what I know works in my past coaching career. So, Ramo, just so you know, is that I had a criteria of the type of player that I wanted away from the field and a type of player that I wanted on the field. I allocated a, 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 a budget for each of those players, which gave me a cross section of 25 players. And depending on what position they are and what tier they are, was a cal- allocated to a um, a, a a cap, a, a salary issue uh, or a salary price in the cap. The one thing that I, I, I needed to recruit and it was evident being at the club is that um, at the moment in our squad of uh, 29 players, Kieran Dixon is the only player that has a child and that child is under 12 months old. Uh, Matt Cook is the only player in our squad that is married, so it just showed the level of uh, showed the level of uh, or how young our players were. I needed to attract some fathers. I needed to attract some husbands, because uh, as I mentioned before about Josh, they've got other responsibilities away from rugby league, and I think that if we're going to start making people accountable, some people don't know what it's be, what or how to be accountable. So if you have a look at the players that I've attracted to the club, a lot of them in long, um, long-term relationships and or married or, and or have children um, because mixed with the seven or eight young guys we've got coming through, it's going to give us a great cross-section of experience and enthusiasm. And that's what I thought the club lacked the most is the uh, level of um, um, mentors at our club. Linking that with the culture that you mentioned, then I mean, you know, the question is often asked, you know, why for the last few years have the Broncos been sort of sliding away and and, and the results deteriorating? It's very difficult, I think, to to try and put your finger on something because some years they've spent the salary cap and some years they haven't. Some they've gone home for homegrown players or for uh, loan products from from elsewhere. Do you think that the fact is the culture maybe hasn't been right here for the players in that particular year, and that's changed from year to year, but just it hasn't been right, and that's obviously something you're you're trying to put right for next year. Certainly hard for me to say. I've only been here since February, and given that uh, Tony Ray's um, um, arguably saved the club, I was here for a couple of seasons, and before that, uh, young Rob Powell, who, from my understanding, is a, is a fantastic coach in his own right. So given that we've had um, 
um, you know, a CEO, uh, a, an old, uh, you know, CEO move on, a new general manager come on, and three coaches in in four and a half years. Uh, I think the the word that I'm looking for is um, um, consistency. So there's been three head coaches, so different coaching philosophies come along. So it'd be very fair, very unfair for me to say um, and talk about uh, previous previous coaches that, that were in charge. However, one thing that um, um, we we have identified is where do we want to go uh, as a club? We would love the London Broncos to be everyone's second best team. And we want people to stop feeling sorry for us. We're not about getting sympathy. Um, we are going to be relegated. Uh, we are going to championship because we're just not up to this standard. Um, we're spending way under the cap and um, it is what it is. David Hughes, our owner, has been a massive supporter uh, of the London Broncos, in particular myself. He's given me a two-year opportunity and uh, he's uh, given me his guarantee that next year every player will be full-time and we will use to the maximum cap. So uh, that should ensure that we've got a, a greater advantage over um, a lot of the other teams in championship outside Lee and possibly Bradford. Are you happy with what you're putting together for next year then? Absolutely. It's... Um, it's it's information that I've um, learnt over the season, particularly on the back of working with Brian Smith at Parramatta Reels for nine years. Um, I cut my teeth teeth under Brian, um, and he was a real uh, mentor to me and taught me how um, to be a successful skill-based coach. He taught me how to uh, implement successful programs. And um, what he's done, and similarly to his brother Tony, every club they go to, um, they transition into that club and they ch- change that club into something spectacular and special and they uh, f- recruit from within. They, they make their own players come through the, the system and ideally that's what I want to do at London. So I've seen it work. I was part of that process uh, when I was at Parramatta and um, having uh, some discussions with Tony Smith who has been a fantastic mentor to me um, more recently over the last uh, three or four weeks it just justifies that my thought processes and what he's done to Warrington, uh, there are a lot of similarities and cross-references. What has he, what has he told you or what does he let you in on? I mean, sometimes when we hear of these links we, um, or these conversations, you start getting sort of sharing of resources or, you know, players and have gone here and only Any particular links that we'll have with Warrington as Broncos? Or, I mean, is it just sort of things that he's told you that are going to help you and do, do what you do here? He's given me advice on... Um, how to approach things, um, given I've come from a different environment. And that's what I was saying before, Ramo, that um, I'm really proud to be living in, in a country and being given the opportunity to live in the UK. Um, given everyone told me how cold it is, uh, I can't complain about the weather. The weather's been fantastic. You've done well there, haven't you? Yeah, the last two and a half months, Ramo, it's been fantastic. So I'm really blessed how um, the English people have embraced me. Um, I'm a pretty easygoing uh, person anyway, so I've got a, a pretty easygoing character. But... Tony Smith just gives me uh, words of advice about um, systems, um, what to look for in a player, um, the traps that you might uh, fall into, you know, negotiating with clubs on loans and and, uh, dealing with agents and managers. And um, uh, once I get a player, I'll uh, bounce a few ideas off him and he'll give me his thoughts. So he's really given me a, a great insight to... Um, how to identify good prospects at our club, given the criteria we're after in their in their culture or their um, away from life policies or you know what makes them tick and things like that. Ramo, so he's been great to me. Um, every time I, I you know uh, have a player in mind, I'll uh, send him a text or give him a call, and he's only too happy to give me his honest opinion. So it's really difficult for me to come over and understand. Um, the loan system and the dual reg system and I find it I still find it difficult that one person can play for four different teams in the one year uh, which I'm not used to and they're the type of, type of things that I speak to him about of, of systems and structures and what's the best for London Broncos and he's been great for me um, um, since I've been here and we started talking about the win you've worked very hard since you've been here and whenever I come you've always got a smile on your face it's always a, a great positive atmosphere and I think credit to you that it's remained positive here while the run that the club have been on you're obviously enjoying it I mean how much are you enjoying being here you talk about living in a you know your adopted country now but I mean you must be okay some of the results omitted 
enjoying yourself and having a good time? I'm living in one of the best cities in the world. Um, my wife absolutely loves it over here. Me, my uh, daughter's uh, started school uh, when we arrived. Uh, she's a king of the kids. She loves school. My son, Frank, will be starting um, a nursery in September. Um, so for me, the fact that my family love it here just makes it so much easier. Um, the way that um, the fans and the rugby league community have a, a, you know, taken me in as their adopted son, I guess, if you like, uh, is very re refreshing. And having coached now or being head coach in a Super League program and given where the, I want to take the club in the next two years, um, it's certainly something that I've dreamed about. And, yeah, we might be sitting last and we might have won our first game, but um, I've got the best job in the world because I'm coaching a Super League club in one of the best cities in the world. And I've got outstanding backroom staff uh, and I believe that uh, we've signed 22 players for next year's squad who I believe in what I, uh, me and my staff and our club um, are going to unravel in the next two years. And who knows, with a, a little bit of luck and a lot of hard work, we could finish in that top four next year and rival to get back into Super League uh, in 2015 or 2016. And you may not want to answer the direct question of will you win another game this year, but how likely is a victory or how hard do you work to get that victory? Because there are, there's three games there for you and I guess having a win in, under your belt now, you wouldn't put it past you. Yeah, I wouldn't put it past us at all. And um, Not that I would encourage betting, but if you have a look at the, the systems and the, uh, the games, how they've fallen, uh, a lot, most teams that have lost three games in a row, lost three games in a row, uh, once they win their first game, they go in on to win a second game. So um, we're going off to Le Catalans, which is probably not the best time to play Le Catalans, given the heat and given their, their run and their success over the past um, you know, uh, six or seven weeks. However, I feel we should have beat them at Magic Weekend. Uh, we turned down a 14-point deficit and had a try disallowed when we played them at home. So if there's one team we do enjoy playing... It's uh, the Cattle and Dragons. So, um, and the pressure's off us a little bit now. Hopefully we can um, play a little bit of uh, free-flowing football and, and back ourselves and back our ability because that's what we did on the weekend with our young halves and um, some of our forwards. It's really appreciated for uh, Joey to spare all the time, really, to chat about everything from uh, since he's arrived to the club and how it's all been and how he's going now and the things that he's building for 2015, as I said before. It'll be interesting to hear what you make of his thoughts, the culture that he's trying to build. The You know, he's obviously, I, I think, you know, spotted that the, some things that were going on at the club weren't quite right. I thought it was really interesting, the fact that he mentioned when he looked around and players and people at the club didn't have children you know didn't have families and what he wanted was some um you know some almost like role models people who can be a father figure within the team again something that i hadn't particularly thought of when you when you're recruiting a side but it's obviously something that he believes a lot in and those are the people that he's trying to get around the uh, young players at the club to try and build that bond try and establish things so it's more than just a team and a club i guess for next year so your thoughts please uh, if you want to tweet uh, send me a message at Ian Ramsdale or you can use the hashtag RLDS of course for a rugby league down south or the email rldownsouth at gmail.com I mentioned before I was chatting with uh, Andrew Henderson at a dinner um, before the Challenge Cup final um, he's obviously coming down to be assistant coach with Broncos next year he's obviously ch chatting to uh, Joey Grimer a, a fair bit probably, you know, as, as much as he can squeeze in between the busy bits that he's doing for uh, the Sheffield Eagles but he's having you know, a good few chats with Joey um, and what he was saying to me on, on Friday was when they talk to players they sell them the magic that, that was the, a phrase that he kept going back to they sell them the magic of what could happen um, in London and, and what they're trying to build and what they're trying to do we sell them the magic and I think it's a, it's a great way um, a phrasing quite what is happening will the magic work will the trick work who knows we'll find out next year um, but uh, Andrew Henderson very excited to be joining Broncos next year um, can't wait to, to get stuck in uh, at the deep end and thinks that the squad that they're uh, building um, will will go well in the championship in 2015 so uh, yeah I'm sure we'll hear from uh, Hendo in the next few weeks and months as we build up to um, next season of course 2015 when you think about it it isn't too far away really at the moment is it no now then, to uh, we mentioned the Challenge Cup final. Of course, it, the the Champions Schools uh, competition always uh, finishes the week before, or the the day before, really the uh, 
the Challenge Cup final. Uh, there was a year 10 girls side from Lee Academy in Dartford. Uh, interesting in how you uh, you spell Lee, as in Lee Centurions uh, from the north. I wonder how many people actually see it and think that, you know, it's uh, you know, it was Lee Academy beating Castleford Academy. And I wonder whether they just think, oh, okay. It's the Academy from Lee. Uh, but no, Lee Academy Dartford is uh, how I refer to them. Um, from Kent, uh, champion schools last year as year nine, champion schools this year as year 10, defending their title, the first ever Southern school to do so. Uh, I've been chatting to their PE teacher, a man we've spoken to a few times on the programme before, Matteo Stamato, about what it was like, what the weekend was like, and how they feel that they are the very first Southern school to defend a champion school's title. Matteo, uh, just tell me, what was it like on Friday? I mean, I, I was following the game, I saw the news, and, well, I mean, it must have been a great day. Uh, it, it was an absolutely fantastic day, Ian. Um, I won't lie, it, it was an emotional day for friends, uh, family, players, and, and myself and Julie Austin, another female uh, member of the PE department. It, it's just an unbelievable achievement, uh, which I hope everyone sort of takes on board uh, what we've actually achieved here. How big is it then? What you've achieved? You know, we we talked about it before, but you know, the first Southern school to defend a champion school's title. Yes, absolutely. The girls have worked tirelessly to ensure that not only did we win, uh, we win convincingly, uh, and and we retain that title. It's, it it means a lot to myself and, and to the students as well, and the players there. They they wanted to win, and they were willing to give up their time and and just raise the profile of of female sport rugby league in the south and raising the profile of the school and, and the good things that we do here I was just going to ask you about those three things in particular you know sort of the waves that this has caused has, has it caused a wave within the school because I think you're you're back at the school this week uh, absolutely we're, we're back at school today with, uh, with, with all the staff doing teacher training this week and it, it was the first thing item on the agenda uh, <laughs> to ensure that all the staff knew what actually happened and and how convincingly that we, we did that. There's some video footage coming soon as well. So when we meet up again uh, next week for our, for another staff training, every every teacher will know about this, and every student will know uh, as we go into all the assemblies, and every student will see what what a great achievement it, the, these girls have had, and perhaps that will inspire the next generation to come through and and sort of stake their claim to that that national championship. The other one of the other three that you mentioned was, you know, rugby league in the south as well. What sort of waves has it caused within sort of those circles? It's it, it's a promising start. Absolutely, there's there's lots of people coming forward uh, from external clubs and um, trying to speak speak to the girls uh, to ensure they continue playing rugby league if they can. Uh, lots of the girls have other commitments outside of school, mm-hmm. um, uh, sporting wise. That it, it, it's a it's a unique blend that that we had this year. Um, allowing students to understand there is access beyond the school day to two different sports especially rugby league it is uh, has been fantastic you've had medway dragons helping out uh dave lawrenson from the london broncos coming down as well and some of the guys from the broncos mm. just 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 helping the girls and um reiterating the, the good things that they're doing and and showing them that there is something beyond uh, just playing at school level as well and what have you found about um, media coverage as well? Because this is obviously a, a big thing. I know you've been trying to hey, get a bit of media coverage for the school and for the girls themselves, a sort of bit of recognition for, for what they've done. Uh, local media around there, I guess, must love a story like this, but I guess further afield it becomes a bit more difficult. It, it does. Um, uh, we, as you say, we are trying to tap into as many local papers and uh, we've been using the school Facebook and the Twitter page uh, that the department has here. It's trying to raise the exposure not just only in Dartford and Kent and, and across across the country as well. Uh, as you say, it is, it is a very north-dominated sport, um, hence why Castleford had, had so many teams in yeah. the different age groups down there. Yeah. And uh, it, it's just raising that profile. So if there's anyone out there, I know you've got hundreds and thousands of listeners that listen to <laughs> your I wish, I wish. <laughs> if, uh, if, if they'd like to phone me up, I'll, I'll be more than willing to have a chat with them and and go through some of the secrets to, to our success and how we've done it for two years. I usually get into the hundreds, not necessarily the thousands. <laughs> not necessarily hundreds of thousands uh, either. Um, but Matthew, as well, I mean, uh, you know, Friday must have been a great day um, winning at, at, um, at Richmond with the girls there. But then, I mean, Saturday, you get to parade around Wembley, don't you? Yep, Wembley, Wembley was a great, great experience, uh, not only for myself, but for the girls again. I think there was about 77,000 in the stadium uh, just before kickoff, 
Um, it's good just to parade and again raising that exposure of the girls and, and rugby league in general really um, it, it's a great sport for them and trying to ensure that we get to wave and smile to every camera that was possibly there it's it's something that will stay with me and, and, and with the girls for, for as, long, as long as we live it and it is the highlight of my, my career and having been able and successful to do it twice uh, it, it's just uh, unthinkable I want to finish with three separate questions then. One about you, one about the girls, and, and one about the school. In terms of, you know, you mentioned you there and, you know, it being um, a, a great day for you. I know that when you first came to the school and, you know, these girls wanted to play rugby league, I mean, what do you think now of rugby league compared to what you did when you joined that school? Yeah, I, I totally support rugby league and what the Rugby Football League governing body are doing. They're, they're working tirelessly to spread the word of rugby league and that they should be... Uh, rewarded and sort of mentioned here I mean, that they spend a lot of time spreading the word and getting people to help uh, members of staff um, get into schools and, and, and start lips club, clubs up which is really important um, yes I was a bit apprehensive at first just due to sort of football and rugby union background but um, I've said from the start it's a very simple game where you can transfer the skills from one, one code to another and it's generic skills that you can actually pass on to other different sports as well. So, And the girls have been so unique and, and special in that and they've taken on board the, the training that they've had. And what about the girls? You know, pro- pro- professional uh, women's sport at the moment, you know, it, it, it can't really rival men's when you talk about it. It doesn't necessarily provide that career path that, you know, the men's sport across a number of uh, sports can, can do. But what, what about these girls? I mean, what sort of future? Will, do you think they'll go on to carry on playing rugby league? Was this just a, a thing that they did while they're in school, which is always going to be beneficial, you know, in the future? They'll always, I think, you know, refer back fondly to, to rugby league. So it's not a bad thing. But what do you, what do you think their future within the game is, if anything? Uh, it, it, it's difficult. It is, it is difficult for me to sort of comment on that. They, they have a lot of commitments outside of school. We've got, got some England athletes, England netballers. We've got people that represent the county and district uh, as well at different, many different sports. And the, the girls are coming to an age where they, they will almost have to decide which path they will go down in which sport they will have to follow, um, just due to time constraints. It, it's hard, and I'd, I would love for them to follow on uh, and play rugby league beyond the school day. I, I really would, and, and I think things like the women, women uh, winning the uh, women's World Cup recently in rugby yeah. union yeah. that will help. We've had the Commonwealth Games where female athletes have been doing really well. Mm. It, it, it just can't be a localised thing. It has to be an, a whole national approach, and that's something I will be speaking to the uh, governing body about to see if there is a female outlet because there is a demand for it because mm. the, the school's competition has shown that so whether someone can coordinate within the national governing body that that will be an interesting path for them perhaps to pursue for, the, for people like like the girls that we've got here uh, who, who look to carry some one thing to bear in mind, I wrote a, a programme piece uh, for the London Broncos match day programme a couple of months ago now about someone I'd met who'd been a, a big sponsor of an event in the London Rugby League in the South, now working in the city. But the reason that they were doing it is because they played rugby league when they were at school when they were younger, loved it, and when they got this opportunity to support a rugby league game, you know, they did, and, and they're pumping money into the game now, um, you know, which is great to see, all because they played it at school. Didn't go on to play it, but I think it's one of those stories that you, that you can see sort of was set in that you know set in position while that person was at school and talking of your school i love the fact that it was top of the agenda when you got back for your teacher training days the end of your summer holidays that's brilliant um but what is the the school reaction now to rugby league may there be more of it you're going to play more or, or was this again just a short experiment um if, if i'm honest Ian, it's, it's a bit early to say where 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 we're going to go with this that it will always be in the curriculum i will being director of sport here, I will always ensure it is part of the curriculum we offer and the sports we offer the students here uh, through rugby league as one of the sports we will ensure we meet all the, the different strands that we have to within physical education. So that that is a definite. Whether it will continue, uh, it, it's it's hard to say. Uh, whether I, 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 there is a possibility I will step away from this, it's probably a good time to leave on a high mm. it's a difficult one to say at the moment um, many of the girls enter into their GCSEs um, 
when we come back in next week as well with the students. So it, it's a difficult time, and I wouldn't want to place too much pressure uh, on the students to continue. Um, everything has come from them from the last two years, and that's the way it should be. Um, I, I would, I'm reluctant to put pressure on them to do it one more time in such a, a crucial year for them. Um, and I think the girls know that, and if, if they're ready when we regroup, uh, in a couple of weeks' time when the dust has settled. We, we will look at it, um, but I can't promise that. There, there are some younger girls who hopefully this will now inspire them. They've had a taste for it themselves. They'll be year nine when we come back in next week. So we'll, we'll have a good little chat with them and see if we can uh, mould them into national champions as well. Cracking chat with uh, Matteo. Great to see things going so well. And I mean, what a story. Um, just exceptional. Congratulations once again the year 10 girls at the academy and all we can hope is that there's things like this and little shoots little green shoots in the capital that go go on to to blossom whether it be in the the girls and the women's game or whether it be in the men's game or whether it be through scholars or hemel or across the south um you know oxford gloucestershire uh, south wales scorpions you know whoever um, did I mention Hamill? Um But whoever, you know, wherever they go, you'd hope that these little green shoots of just rugby league stories um, can just make a little bit of difference in the future. And as we always say, it's a slow burn, but it does seem like, um, and again, we were set back by the Broncos' woes last year, but you'd, you'd hope that the game is back on that forward momentum. Um, in fact, the game never stopped below Broncos. You'd hope that Broncos are now joining them in that forward momentum for 2015. It's been a very tough year this year I wonder what next year could be like for the game in general across the south as we mentioned the south we mentioned all the other teams that are involved um, one of them the South Wales Scorpions had a feature interview with the chairman of uh, Wales RL in the programme last week if you didn't manage to um, to hear that interview with Brian Julith then uh, have a listen to last week's uh, podcast we covered all sorts of topics with him as well um, but one person um, in fact it was Carl um, on Twitter put me in touch with uh, Paul Emanuele um, of the South Wales Scorpions uh, he's their assistant coach he's also the head coach at the uh, amateur side the Valley Cougars who've had a run into the end of season playoffs and finals so I thought I'd catch up with Paul about what's going on at the uh, Valley Cougars, and also we'll touch on the South Wales Scorpions as well. So here is uh, Paul Emanuele. Paul, first of all, um, you seem to have had a, a really positive year as part of the um, you know the head coach at the Valley Cougars. You're into end of season playoffs. We are, yes. Um, it's our first year back playing um, national conference level. Um, it took us a while to get used to it. Lost our first two or three games, but um, since there we've uh, we've really moved on and finished the league second and now got a home tie against Nottingham Outlaws uh, in two weeks time So obviously um, you know you want to maintain a bit of form uh, going into that end of season uh, run just give us a, um, a, a sort of a quick rundown as to sort of what division you're in because you're in the National Conference which is sort of between isn't it Scorpions and, and a lot of the coverage that we do around the, the amateur clubs in the you know the, the divisional um, leagues Yes, yeah, it is. Um, we we actually run a second team, which which run in the uh, Welsh Conference. Uh, the Welsh Conference can be a bit hit and miss with fixtures, which led us last year to apply to go into the conference. Um, and now we're playing teams like um, Sheffield Hallam, who haven't lost. They they top. Uh, they're a feeder club for Sheffield, obviously. And you've got Oxford, um, who are Oxford, who are in the Scorpions League. Um, reserve team so it's, it's a lot of that it's, it's a massive step up in standard in comparison to our national uh, competition so I guess this I mean, you obviously you play uh, or you're, a, you're, a, you're assistant coach that's uh, your official yeah. role isn't it with the, uh, with the with the Scorpions but the, the Valley Cougars and the close links must help it does yeah yeah we've had several training sessions together um, there's probably five or six of the Cougars that have um, sort of progressed from there into the Scorpions as the season's developed. So it, it works well for both clubs. And what about the, the Scorpions this year? Um, you know, we, we talked to Mike Grady quite frequently. I spoke to um, Brian Julith, the, the chairman of Wales RL, on the program last week about sort of you know rugby league in Wales in general. But um, I guess it's been a good development season for the Scorpions, but you'll all be hoping to, to push on next year. Are you going to be involved with them next year? 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, we've got a, a meeting Friday evening with sort of uh, Chris Day, Brian Julif, as you say, uh, Mike Grady, uh, myself, just sort of everyone that's involved uh, behind the scenes as well. Um, I think the budget's going to be very similar to last year, so I think it's going to be maybe another difficult season. Um, we've gone with very young, all well side. Um, to be honest, I don't think a lot of people expect us to win any game. We've won two, perhaps could have won another three or four, and we've definitely progressed as the season's gone on. So, yeah, like you said, hopefully we can well keep most of the players um, on the current budget and, and push on, maybe get another two come in from somewhere and perhaps get another couple of wins next year. You talk about progressing as the season goes on. Um, it's a bit of a shaky start, wasn't it, with the Cougars? But then you, you put together an amazing run at the end of the year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very similar. Um, I think a lot of the boys didn't realise the step up in the Cougars. Um, it took us a good three or four games. We had a couple of um, hammerings off Sheffield, Nottingham, Oxford. But since then, like you say, I think we've only won... I uh, only lost one game in about the last 10 and um, really pushed on and made the second spot our own, really. And I should just ask you as well, um, Carl Jones is a guy who's uh, listened to the podcast for quite a while, has always been very supportive of what we've done, always keeps me up to date with what's going on with uh, things in, in South Wales as well as the Cougars. Um, how's Carl getting on? Yeah, he's doing well. He's uh, he's played for me for a while. Uh, he does a lot of travelling, in fairness to him. Uh, the Valley Cougars is... Uh, it's a good hour where we are based from where he lives. Um, so he, he does his best to make as much training as he can. Been available most of the season and, and he'll probably start tomorrow against um, Sheffield. We haven't confirmed our team, but he's in it more than he's not. And we should, we always mention as well where, where we can other people's um, day jobs and what they do to sort of uh, keep the money ticking over at home. Yeah. You, you, you run a golf club, don't you? Yeah, yeah. I worked at uh, Whitehall Golf Club um, based in Aberkenan. Uh, I've worked there now nine years. I've been the head greenkeeper, so uh, busy time of the year for me. I was going to say, uh, what, is, there, is there a busy season or when does your busy season come and, and, and why is it? Because of the weather or is it because of the amount of people that play on the course? Yeah, yeah. It's, um, obviously, there's a lot more cutting uh, during the summer season. Um, during the winter, the grass basically doesn't grow, so it's a lot of uh, the odd jobs and just maintenance during them. Then months and then March till probably the end of October. Really busy. Well, good luck in the rest of the season with the Valley Cougars. I hope it goes well for you. Thank you, Ian. That's great. Cheers, man. So that's Paul Emanuel of the uh, Valley Cougars, the head coach there and the uh, the assistant coach uh, at the South Wales Scorpions. I think he was out, uh, probably out on the golf course when we were talking to him as well. Very windy, wasn't it, uh, down in South Wales. But no, thank you to him for talking to us. And that's it for Rugby League Down South uh, for this week. Uh, an extra special programme. I'd like to say I'll get these programmes out whenever I can, so that's two in two weeks. I'm doing well, aren't I? Um, the next couple of weeks might be a little bit sparse. We'll see how things go. Um, I hope you enjoyed the chat with uh, Joey Grimer and, uh, yeah, interesting stuff. Great to see the uh, the Lee Academy going well. And I was thinking as well about the interview uh, from the Academy and um, you know, I was talking about they're not sure what will happen with Rugby League at the school and this team in the future. I, you know, I thought, these things go in waves, don't they? You know, you, you, if there is no interest there, um, then all you can hope is that there is increased interest um, from what's been there before. And you'd have thought that the girls and the success that they've had have put an increased interest in rugby league, whether it means that they continue to um, field sides in the competition for the next few years or not, or whether they have a few years away or whether, you know, I don't know. I, I, I think it's a very positive thing, even if they don't go on to run a team for the next five years or so. Um, you know, they've had that experience. They've, they've had that record. They've set it. It will always be something that people will talk about. And you never know what might happen in the future. It's never a bad thing that these things happen in the past, is it? Uh, right, that's it then for Rugby League Down South. Thank you very much once again for listening. Please do tweet, email, uh, send us your comments, and I shall bring you another programme whenever I can. Promise. <laughs> <laughs>